Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Coming to you from Rochester, Minnesota. Certain things ain't the same now. Our town. To navigate these problems. I'm by myself, you're not around. Today we're checking in with Dan Fifield, co-founder and president of The Landing MN, to learn more about how they continue to support our fellow community members that are facing homelessness and housing instability. So great to have you on. Welcome back to the show, Dan. Thanks, Nicole. It's great to be here. So um, we were just chatting a little bit before this about how um, I first met you. We first met in 2019 when you first founded The Landing. Um, in what key ways has The Landing grown over the last few years? Oh, geez, it's, it's grown so much more than what we could have ever hoped for, too. Um, you know, we started out as a street outreach, a street ministry. We were working out of the back of our Ford Edge. We were out wandering around the streets, the sidewalks, the, the skyways. That was when we had the uh, the big uh, population that was sleeping in the skyways that was pre-warming center days uh, back in early 2019. We started in 2018, formally formed uh, the organization in the first part of 19 and really hit the streets then. But, um, you know, from a street outreach ministry to a, a day center uh, throughout the pandemic has been a, a whirlwind over the last three years. That's amazing. Um, you know, of course, we are in the middle of Minnesota. It is winter. We are in the middle of an ongoing pandemic situation. Um, in just the past few months, what su support and services um, have you been providing individuals at this time? We're open from eight in the morning till seven in the evening, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We do not take holidays off. We don't, uh, you know, we're there all the time because uh, the last time we checked, uh, homelessness doesn't get holidays off. So um, we're there all of the time um, taking care of these individuals that come through our doors. Uh, the first month of this year, we saw 260, um, a little bit more than 260 unique individuals that came in for services, 199 of those identified as being homeless uh, here in Rochester last month in January. Um, so the numbers are there. Um, there's, there's a continued upswing in homelessness here in Rochester. We see new faces all the time. Um, services that we offer at the day center, besides just a soft place to land, and a lot, a lot of times that's all people need. It's just that place to come in and try and get get focused and regroup on what they're doing. Um, but we offer the, the basic care needs, showers, laundry, um, food, uh, somebody to talk to, uh, somebody to help get you grounded again and maybe refocus things. Um, our staff is tremendous about doing that, building those relationships with those individuals. I think the biggest thing that we've seen change um, and happen in, in our growth is that we now um, offer medical care uh, at our facility um, six days a week soon to be seven. Um, we have a doctor that's there three days a week in the afternoons, Dr. Caldwell. Um, we have nursing students that are there on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. We're soon to have a doctor there on Thursday afternoons from one until four. Um, we have the community paramedics from the community paramedicine program. There, they'll be there on Tuesday and Thursday mornings and, no, I'm sorry, Tuesday and Thursday afternoons, the Thursday afternoons when Dr. Luke is not there. Uh, but um, Saturday mornings as well. So that's a, that's a change. Sundays, I don't know that we'll have anybody, but we may very well have medical students on that day. Um, we've got a lot of things going on with Mayo Clinic as far as the medicine end of it's concerned. Um, helping get people placed in housing, um, getting their insurance in place, getting SNAP cards, uh, food stamp benefits, things of that nature. So and we cover the gamut as far as uh, helping people get connected to services. So, yeah, No, that's amazing. And I, I really resonated with what you said, homelessness doesn't take a day off and so much of your mission is, is really dedicated to that radical care, the compassion, the dignity and connecting um, folks. So um, we have a couple of seconds here. Can you just let folks know how they can continue to support your work um, and just, yeah, just know where you are and, and how to connect with you? Well, right now our lease is up the end of, end of um, April on the fire station. Uh, we've been told that we're not gonna get an extension. We have an offer out on a piece of property in the downtown area. Uh, everybody can keep the good thoughts up, say prayers if you're of, of that sort. Uh, that these things get worked out. Um, talk to your city council representatives. Uh, if you're in agreement with what we do, uh, make your voice be heard. Uh, financial donations we always need to help cover the costs. Uh, we have a, a staff of 13 that likes to get paychecks every other Friday. Uh, so we need you know the financial support, and we, especially if we're to purchase this building. Um, it'll be a multi-million dollar proposition for us and for our organization. So. 
Well, thanks so much, Dan. Um, we hope to stay in touch with you and, and keep uh, bringing you back uh, to share more about the work that you're doing. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Nicole. Be sure to stick around. We have much more coming your way on our town. Danielle Teal learns more about Quarry Hill Nature Center and what they do when the weather is chilly. We also meet author Leilani Rashida Henry and Abby Courier from the History Center of Olmsted County. But up first, we check out the oldest supermarket in Rochester, Silver Lake Foods, in this week's Our Culture segment. The location of the store started out in 1953 with Ross Foods. Uh, at some point in time, it was changed hands, went to an Erdman's grocery store for quite some time. And after that, it was Mr. P's, and then Mr. D's, and then Silver Lake Foods. Sometime around 2001, I believe. Hi, I'm Jason Odell, owner of Silver Lake Foods in Rochester, Minnesota. This place has stood, this is the oldest grocery store in town and it's the only full service grocery store that is owned locally. It's uh, more of like a family store. I wanna say laid back a little bit compared to some of the chain stores. Here, we feel more relaxed. I can talk to the boss anytime I want to. And we have a lot of loyal customers. And we make a lot of friends. My name is Brian Cooper. I'm the store manager here at Silver Lake Foods. Um, I take care of most of the general operations of the store. It's just a neighborhood store. And I think people just like that atmosphere when they come in here. They feel they can get around the store easy enough. And uh, we have a lot of people say, you guys better not close because we need you here. I mean, this is a style of store that used to be popular in the 50s and the 60s. And, um, some people relate to that real well. Being a hometown store, not a chain store is becoming a more unique thing nowadays. The customers have been wonderful. They're understanding, you know, when you don't have certain products because of how today's world is, the customers are great. And then just the service, um, the customers enjoy us, the, the compliments on the employees. And we have the ability to be an independent, I can buy from anywhere. So the customers will ask, hey, could you get this? I said, well, just show me a UPC and stuff like that, and I'll see what I can do, you know? And I had a lot of people say, hey, you got stuff here that I can't get anywhere else, you know? And sometimes it's the older things, you know, that used to be, you know, uh, King Bing bars. You know, we'll do little things too, you know, we'll jump the car for them. You know, it's just those little things that add up to uh, making them feel cared for here. We do delivery service. You know, right now it's only a couple days a week, but again, it's the old fashioned way they call in. You know, we have a lot of elderly people here that aren't up on the technology, so they talk to somebody on the phone, give them their order, we shop it, we deliver it. Whatever you need, you just ask. If we don't offer, we just ask. They come here for our meat, primarily. That's our biggest thing. It's still done the old-fashioned way. It's all cut here, full service, high-quality choice meats. We make primarily everything here. We're very very price competitive in that. We're able to do it a fair amount cheaper than a lot of people. Uh, and the qualities are the same. A lot of changes. It's been interesting to see the store remodel. Uh, primarily when uh, Jason took over, he's done a, a huge amount of remodeling. The, the, the decor here we have now, the flooring, um, and recently, last year or so, the outside reface, the lobby, those kind of things. So that's been kind of exciting because you know you're you're not going to spend that money if you're not doing well. And so uh, it helps us to feel like we're growing. You know, it's it's been an exciting business to be in, you know, and it's fun to put back into the business. It has a lot of changes and people's desires change and you have to adapt to them. And, you know, so it's, it's never dull. I'm proud for being here for the number of years I have. I always say I'm going to write a book someday, and each chapter will be about somebody or something. But 50 years in the grocery business, is, it's kind of hard to step away at some point. Hello, 
I'm Danielle Teal, your moderator for Our Town, The Spotlight. This segment covers organizations, events, and happenings across Rochester, and we'd like to thank 125 Live for hosting and laying up our guest. And today we have Christine Beach with Copia Via, and she is here to talk about what that entails. Welcome, Christine. Thank you, and thanks for having me. Of course. Yeah. So please share a little bit about it and um, how it got started. Sure. So I started Copia Via two years ago. And the real reason was because I was helping a lot of women start businesses and I was really engaged with the entrepreneurial community. And at the time, I realized that that same service wasn't going to nonprofits. So I started Copia Via with this understanding, it means many paths, right? So it's, it's the idea that you can take a lot of paths to reach your goal, but how might you do that best? And so we do business planning support for nonprofits. That's really cool. And that is very much needed um, in this community, but all across. Um, so what are the what are the services you you technically provide during that? So really the focus when I started this was how to bring those business planning processes to the nonprofits, specifically when they started to get reduced donations during COVID. Um, they weren't able to hold galas. They were struggling to uh, generate revenue. And so I was coming alongside several nonprofits, helping them figure out how to change their planning a little bit to incorporate more revenue generating models. And so that was kind of how it got started. And so I end up providing, I realized that to do that, you need to be involved with the strategic planning. So I do strategic planning. Uh, I do board education because that's a big part of it. People understanding their role as board members and their, you know, how to interact best with the ED with all the stakeholders. So we do board retreats, strategic planning, um, and really helping people map out business processes for their organization. Well, I know this is a great need for nonprofits, so I'm certain that you are a popular woman when it comes to this. How can folks connect with you? Um, so probably the easiest way is copiavia.com and I'm at Christine at copiavia.com. Um, and if they're interested in learning a little bit more about it after they look at the website, we have some upcoming workshops through the Rochester Area Foundation, which are being sponsored by Clifton Larson Allen. So they're super cheap. People can come and learn more about how to do things like map their assets and figure out how to reach their donors and, and engage with the stakeholders um, and create a new way of doing business. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. No problem. Thanks for having me. Hello again, Rochester. This is Michael Wojak with an Our Town Legislative Rundown. We're taking a look at what's going on in St. Paul and how it affects our community here in Rochester. Last week, we took a deep dive into what the priorities were for Olmstead County. And this week, we're gonna talk a little bit about the school district and what our schools are looking to get accomplished in this year's legislative session. As mentioned, Last time, there's about a $7.7 .7 billion projected budget, so there's a lot of talk of tax cuts and additional investments in other areas. So we're gonna focus on what some of those possibilities are as they pertain to the schools. Let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges that the schools face. You might know that the Olmsted County boundaries have been the same since the 1800s. The city of Rochester, we understand where the city boundaries are and they have been growing as the city has been growing as well. But school district boundaries are a whole nother thing and it's not necessarily intuitive of how they were created. This comes into play when school districts try to plan for their futures. The city of Rochester as it grows to the northwest is actually increasingly building homes that will fall in the Byron School District. And that's a challenge for, from Byron's standpoint in terms of getting busing to access there efficiently, and also in terms of Rochester in terms of planning for the future because a portion of our growth is not going to fall in the district. At the same time, we're growing into Byron's district that way. The Rochester School District actually has parts of the district that are in Wabasha County. So we actually bus a lot of kids past other districts to bring them into ours. And you can imagine that it creates a lot of logistical concerns. Now, Every level of government complains about unfunded mandates, and that's true of cities, counties, and school boards as well. I can tell you from serving parts of three decades on the city council, there is no job more thankless and more difficult to do than being a school board member. They hands down have the hardest time, and part of the reason for that is, 
For all the challenges of city and county government, we get to set our tax levy. That's not the case with the schools. The schools become entirely dependent on the state and some of those formulas are not necessarily fair to our district and it creates incredible challenges and we'll see that in terms of some of the priorities that the Rochester School District are asking to see addressed at the state level. I'd like to thank school board member Julie Workman for taking the time to get me some information about Rochester School District's uh, priorities at the state level. There's four of them that they laid out. First one is an increase in the per pupil funding formula. That is, they're asking for 2%, which as you know is well below inflation right now, but then they're also asking going forward that that figure be indexed to inflation. Inflation has really cut the amount of funds that schools have at their disposal in the last couple of decades. One of the challenges Rochester and other schools face is a lot of times when it comes to poverty numbers, that depends on self-reporting for things like free and reduced lunch, and we don't always get complete and accurate results as a result of that. They're asking for new ways to measure poverty within local districts. They are looking to investigate and possibly expand PTEC uh, statewide. It's been successful here in Rochester. This is a program transitioning kids into professional and technical roles with companies like IBM and Mayo supporting the program here locally. And finally, there's more work to be done on community schools, which is the idea that we have these tremendous assets around the community, but they're not necessarily available to the community, particularly those most in need in the after hours. And we can be a leader in the community school space. This is especially important when you see organizations like the YMCA closing down and the impact that that's having on kids as well. Does this look good? I think that looks good right there. Three, two, one. Hello, I'm Danielle Teal with R10 Walkabout and we are talking with our guests remotely. As you can see, we have Lori Forsty from the Quarry Hill Nature Center and she is right in front of the Prairie House, correct? That's right, yep. Awesome. And it's, of course, it's cold outside. Tonight's event is our candlelight hike, cocoa and bonfires. Um, so just a really great opportunity to get outdoors in the winter. And that's a, it's a perfect excuse to get outdoors in the winter because Minnesota is such a beautiful backdrop and especially at Quarry Hill. What has been the response from people participating? Is it just mostly families, couples, groups? What, what does that look like? It's really a combination of all of those things. Um, families, uh, it's a way for people to get out um, and be with their friends and their acquaintances outdoors. Um, so we see all ages, all size groups. Um, everybody out enjoying it. What are the other winter uh, events that are planned? It's great skiing and snowshoeing right now. So we, uh, we're definitely renting uh, skis. Snowshoes, we'll need a few more inches of that white stuff before we can get those um, out the door. We've got It's Snow Crazy coming up, with this, which is a great sort of festival type event where families can come and bowl on the frozen pond, throw some snow snakes, make some maple candy. March, sometimes we do maple syruping. We'll have to see if Mother Nature cooperates and we can do that this year. Okay, well sign me up for that because I'm gonna be interested in, in that endeavor. Thank you for being on the show, Lori. Thank you. Thank you. This is Danielle Teal with Our Time Walkabout. Heart turn cold, lost control. Looking at this beautiful distraction. Fell in love with a fatal attraction. For 80 years ago, George Gibbs Jr., who would later call Rochester home and come to be celebrated as one of the city's foremost community and civil rights leaders, became the first person of African descent to go to Antarctica. Now, eight decades later, his daughter Leilani Rashida Henry embarks on her own journey and invites readers on an adventure to discover this continent at the edge of the world. She's got a book out called The Call of Antarctica, Exploring and Protecting Earth's Coldest Climate. And today we are really excited to be joined by author Leilani Rashida Henry, as well as Abby Currier from the History Center of Olmsted County, who will be hosting an upcoming author talk. Welcome both of you to our town. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. So Leilani, what inspired you to write this book? I have to say that I didn't really want to write it. <laughs> and I felt like there was a legacy building. So in 2002, Rochester named a street after my father. And then in 2009, the school was named after him. And we all have buildings and streets that have names of people we know nothing about. So I thought the, the biggest thing was to get the, his story out there so that people would understand why the street and the school was named after him. There's so much 
here in Rochester, there is so much, as you said, uh, history and legacy around um, your father, uh, your family in general. Um, and But this was a very specific part of your father's history, um, one that a lot of people don't know. I know I remember being really excited when I first moved to Rochester to find this out. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you conducted research for this book um, and, and this journey to Antarctica? Sure. Well, the first thing that happened was that we found his diaries uh, at the back of the dresser when my mother moved after he passed away. And I was thrilled because he always said, well, I, I haven't finished my book because I don't have enough information. And I thought, well, if you don't have enough information, then what am I going to do? So when the, when the diaries showed up, then I thought, okay, this, this is it. He wrote every day for six months on this round trip, on the first round trip to uh, Antarctica. So the first thing was getting the diaries and the next step was I, I went to the Library of Congress, I went to the National Archives, I went to the Bird Polar Research Center and started to piece together the story and it was a classified mission. Every book that I looked at deleted the third expedition or they didn't have it in there. I also spoke with people that were either on the ship or had relatives that were on the ship also. And so that's how I was able to piece things together. It looks like there was a little bit of mystery there too. So there's the history part of it and that research and then the, the, the mystery of it. Um, I'm also interested in um, just, if can you tell us a little bit about just your travel to Antarctica and what that experience was like? I was there in 2012. I landed on Ernest Shackleton's 138th birthday. <laughs> And it was an auspicious time for me. And I was only there a day and a half. So I, I had to raise $7,500 just to, to get there. And then because I wanted to fly and not take a boat there, it just was a short amount of time. So I went, I went to King George Island, which was again, no, just a coincidence. It wasn't named after my father. And we hiked around. Um, I, I, I stayed in a, a research base and no, you, you can no longer do that now. You have to sleep on the ice in a tent. So, <laughs> um, but it was walking around, seeing the wildlife, listening to the silence and the sky and taking in the glaciers and the ocean. So I got a, a really quick glimpse and I, I really understood the pattern of Antarctica by going there. Just you, the picture that you're painting too, I think um, we're living in such an interesting time, of course, um, and there's a lot of um, just the idea of what is, what is global and like the care of our planet and all of these things. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that trip just kind of deepened your understanding of how we take care of our planetary home and ultimately each other? Definitely. That, and that's really my mantra, Nicole, thanks for asking, is that the way that we take care of each other and the, the inclusion, looking at diversity is absolutely mirrored in how the planet is taken care of, absolutely is how what's happening on the planet, I believe. It starts with the relationships that we have with, with other people and with other creatures. I deepen my understanding because I was at Bellinghausen station and that station was a trash dump years before that now I didn't know that until later but there's a, a couple of women who wrote a book called the Antarctic book of cooking and cleaning and they actually went there to clean up the environment the scientists and the explorers have cleaned up what they do there now you can't leave anything leave no trace and then uh, in my research, realizing, you know, how the temperature is shifting, how the ice is shifting, the place where one of the places that my father built is uh, melted away, broke off. And uh, the other piece of the story is that the snow cruiser is at the bottom of the ocean. And I'm also working with the Thwaites Glacier team. And they, that's the largest glacier that people are watching. It's melting from underneath. That was the biggest aha, I think, in the beginning of my research was finding out that the continent, the ice, the ice shelf was melting from within. Sure. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Abby, can you tell us just a little bit about the event that's going to be happening at the History Center of Olmsted County and how community members can find out more? Yeah, so um, the History Center of Olmsted County, we try to do monthly lectures covering all kinds of different topics. Um, and we're really excited to be partnering with Leilani to have her come out 
and do a book talk and a signing with her book because uh, we love being able to highlight different stories and different aspects of southeastern Minnesota history. So people can find out more um, by going to our website, Olmsted County, or sorry, olmstedhistory.com slash events, and they'll be able to see the tickets there. And it's a hybrid event. So people will be able to either join us in person if they like, or they can buy a virtual ticket and join us over Zoom. So that way they don't have to leave their house if they don't want to. Um, and so we're really excited to be hosting it and to be having Leilani come out here to the History Center. And um, how can we get the book? Will there be some available at the History Center or Leilani is there a website where people can go to get the book if they won't be attending in person? Yeah, so we'll have books at the History Center for sale. Um, like I said, and Leilani will be, able, will be signing them while she's there. Um, but I believe Leilani also has a website where she where people can purchase the books. Yeah, it's the the call of Antarctica.com. And at the very top, uh, you can purchase a signed copy from me to be mailed, or you can go to a couple of websites and also encourage people to go to your local bookstore. I know there are local bookstores in Rochester who also have the book in addition to the History Center. Wonderful. Well, thank you both Leilani and Abby for joining us today. And thank you all for joining us. We are uh, we have wonderful content produced right here in Rochester. So please please be sure to check us out on Facebook and Twitter at hashtag Our Town. And be well and stay safe. We will see you next time on Our Town, the show about Rochester. Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.